All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Fred Kruger. He's a Bitcoin investor, professional trader and entrepreneur with 10 successful exits. He holds a math PhD from Stanford and is a Wall Street veteran having worked there in the 80s and 90s. He shares his opinions on Bitcoin on his popular X and recently created a YouTube channel and never shies away of a discussion with other investors. So uh, I'm happy to talk with him today. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Bram. Awesome to be that here. We, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's awesome to meet people that I just know from Twitter. So that's always, uh, that's always yeah. fun. Um, Same. Yeah, so I have some questions for you. But first, I wanted to ask, like, how do you experience talking about Bitcoin with your generational peers? Like, do you still try to educate them? Like, what's, what's your experience mm -hmm. there? I mean, most of them have given up on, do not, are not open to the idea of Bitcoin. Hmm. So I would say most people that I worked with on Wall Street, very few of them have any interest at all in it. Um, and most people think it's just some kind of Ponzi scheme and uh, it's bullshit, basically. Interesting. That's kind of what most people think in my, my age bracket. But- yeah. There are some notable exceptions, right? Mm -hmm. Well, but, we have but, Larry Lepard, right? I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for example, Larry. Larry, I mean, is he's very rare that people coming from the gold background transition to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people kind of, and once they they're into gold for twenty years, they stay with gold. They 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 don't transition. Yeah. So well, I would say. Uh, but I just think in general, people who have done well in the kind of the fiat world, right? Uh, they, they, you know, they stay in the fiat world and it's, it's kind of rare to kind of change your mindset. Um, yeah. Now Larry Fink has changed his mindset on Bitcoin, but yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not impossible. Right. But there's definitely, there's definitely, it's definitely, not the, the the normal thing. I yeah, think. yeah, I agree. I I tweeted before, like for me, people. Well, also like Greg Foss. You know, I think uh, Greg has in his bio like thirty five years in a risk chair. He, he says, right, and right. Then I think, well, I, I, I'm thirty five. You know, what do I know? Is <laughs> then like kind of my my take there, right? Like that that I find it so interesting that that like what you said, like people who've been in that world for a very long time, the fact that they can turn around almost a 180, right? And adopt Bitcoin. I think for me personally, uh, that's a really big signal because it's a really big like personal challenge, as you said, you know, like it's uh it's difficult to do. Yeah, and I but I think a lot of a lot of them, even if they are accepting of it, they're accepting of it to the you know, five percent of their portfolio kind of accepting of it. You know what I mean? Mm. They're not, they're not full on Bitcoiners. Yeah. So I think it's really tough, you know, when you've made, it's, 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 it's easier when you haven't made a lot of money, right? But when you've made a bunch of money for you to send millions of dollars to Coinbase to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, that's well. You know, that's just, it's a tough thing. I, I did it, but it's, it's tough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's tough getting there. It's a lot easier if you're, you know, if you bought it sort of cheaply and you just saved and, and it went up, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so how do you yeah. now look back on like your Wall Street career and uh, and now that you understand and know about Bitcoin, like how how do you look back, but also how did you get introduced to, to Bitcoin? Well, I mean, I got introduced, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013, right? Mm. So I, I saw it. You know, I'm a tech guy, so I, I I saw it pretty early and I bought some, but I didn't think of it as being any more than just kind of a joke, really. You know, sort of like, okay, this is some kind of sort of interesting, vaguely vaguely interesting thing. I'll buy a few, it's see how it goes. And then I bought it and then I sold it. You know, so Say, same, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like, I didn't really think of it as being, you know. Like I thought the chance of it taking off was pretty low, you know, hmm. and um, 
it really took for me until 2019 before I really kind of, uh, you know, kind of got it, I would say, you know, and I yeah. certainly, you know, I've been around it. I knew people around it. Uh, friends of mine were into it, but like, per, it didn't sort of click for me personally to the point where, okay, I'm going to, I'm yeah. actually going to go out and buy a bunch of this thing. You know what I mean? Like that. And I think that's a personal thing. It's just like who you talk to, what it, what, what it clicks for you. A lot of people have different, you know, roads into it, right? It might be some kind of economic thing. Like you think that inflation is going to take over. That wasn't really it for me, but, um, you know, I just, I, I sort of got it in 2013. I mean, 2019. That's, that's yeah. kind of, and then, you know, after that, I was, I was sort of orange pilled and I added more. Yeah. But, you nice, know, it was yeah. sort of like, uh, you know, right around, you know, a little bit one year before Sailor. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, well, you beat you Sailor. Know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I have yeah. the same path, I think. Like, uh, And that is also what I like to, you know, explore also in this podcast. Because, as you said, it's this personal discovery, right? Like you, I, I am also into Bitcoin from 2013. I bought at 400. I sold at 4,000. You know, I felt great. But now yeah. I have less Bitcoin than before, you know, and uh, right. I saw all tweets of myself tweeting when it went to a hundred dollars. I saw myself tweet. It was uh, a digital commodity. And I was like, damn, I got it, but I didn't get it. You know, like I, right. I understood it to some degree, but I didn't. Well, get I think it. the big, the big thing for me, which is, you know, I, it, it, I was really concerned right up until 2018 that something else was going to win. You know, hmm. because I think that everybody in tech always sort of has this m mentality that, you know, MySpace is going to get displaced by Facebook, that AOL yes. is going to get displaced by Yahoo, which is going to get displaced by Google. Mm -hmm. So we don't we think of it as just pure technology. And you're always sort of thinking, well, there's something better that's going to yeah. come along. You know, yeah. why would I bet on this particular thing when there's something you know, this is slow, expensive. Maybe there's going to be fast and cheap that comes along, you know. So yeah. I was really of that opinion that fast and cheap would win over slow and expensive. Yeah. Well, TCP IP didn't get replaced, right? Like it's more on that level. Uh, yeah. To look at it. I mean, but there's a lot of other cryptocurrencies, right? So, you know, there wasn't a lot of TCP IP competitive that's true you know what i mean yeah that's that's true yeah but you do and see the so, difference now right like well, you, yeah yeah so i i definitely think that that's that's and i think still a lot of people on wall street just fundamentally even if they say they're pro bitcoin fundamentally they may be like well wait a second maybe solana is going to take over avalanche yeah. or something you know you, you know they really fundamentally they're open to that idea yeah I think so that takes I, time to understand as to like which layer does this belong to, right? Should I look at this as as a technology or as a startup creating a token that is fueling a certain ecosystem, or is Bitcoin just a totally different? Right. I mean, I think it's thing. sort of. I think if you think of this thing as payment, as a payment technology, you're missing it, right? You will miss. It. You yeah, will exactly. miss exactly. You will miss the what it is, right? Because mm -hmm. you're like, okay, well. Venmo does really well, you know, Venmo exactly. does pretty good. It's, 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 it works. PayPal works, you know, um, you know, and maybe stable coins are better than, you know, than using, uh, Bitcoin because, you know, stable coins is the dollar. It's, you know, if yeah. you're in Venezuela, the dollar seems pretty good. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, I think that the the problem is I think payment tech you you miss you miss it, and I think the hard thing is realizing that it actually is a new form of money, and yeah. it's you know it's a new it's a new unit of account, and yeah. that's really the hard part because yeah, you know I think it it's so very counterintuitive that that we even why do we need a new unit of account you know like that's it's not clear, like living in America in particular, or Netherlands, right? Yeah. Why do I need I to start, you know, um, going from, you know, the euro to this weird unit of account called Bitcoin? You know, yes. why? 
you know. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. Well, that was actually my my next question. Like what? What do you think is the main f- thing people need to learn before they can understand Bitcoin? Is it that the money that they are forced to use is not really designed to work for them? Or like what, what would you say? Well, there? Look, I've, I've thought about it. Now my thesis is this, is that I think there's a couple things that Bitcoin does much better than regular money, right? And the first thing I think it does is it's, it, it allows your money to be held in custody by yourself and, and, and moved wherever you want. Right. And, you know, if you have euros and you move to America, your euros are basically useless. You know, they, you know, we do not accept the euro over here. Right. Yeah. The dollar, my dollars in, in Netherlands are pretty useless, you know, but Bitcoin is this, this unit where I can hold my, my Bitcoin in a wallet and I can take that wallet anywhere I want in the world. Right. And that's a fundamentally new thing. And I think that's, I think that's actually the killer app of Bitcoin, right? Is that it's sort of, it's money that you can transport, you can hold and you can move around the world. Right. That's the first thing I think it's just, and no, no, nothing has this because Fiat really has to be stored in the bank account, right? Yeah. And, and then there's some third party that's kind of gating it. Um, Bitcoin can be stored, you know, just in a wallet, right? And so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, you know, I can send Bitcoin anywhere to anybody anywhere in the world without a, an intermediary either, right? So I don't need a, a checkbook to send it. I don't need a wire to send it. I can send it to anybody in the world. And again, that's a, that's a really new thing, right? Now, other cryptocurrencies have that capability as they have the capability of the wallet, right? But I would think those two things are the thing that are, that are the, the biggest um, capabilities of, 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 of crypto in general, right? And mm-hmm. then the third thing is, you know, this sort of finite supply, right? So, you know, it cannot be debased. And I think between those things, I think you have something that is extremely powerful and it's extremely powerful for, for people to keep their money out of the reach of the government. Yeah. And uh, that I think is the biggest, that's the use, that's the core driver of Bitcoin's growth. Uh, Number one driver is I want to take my money and I want to move it outside of the banking system. I want to move it outside of the government system. And And how, how much do you think people should understand that, um, like what you said, the finite supply, but also the issuance, right? It cannot be debased like that. They have to understand how that is enforced, right? With all the incentives within, um, the miners uh, and and right. And so I think those sort of two that's... things, right? One is understanding crypto in general, right? Because Bitcoin works the same as all other cryptos, more or less, right? Whether it's Ethereum or anything, right? You have a wallet in usage, store. yes, in usage, yeah, in terms right? of the usage, right? Mm-hmm. And then there, then then there's also why is this particular one special, <laughs> right? Yes, exactly. That, that that's that's really the so the first thing is just. Can do you understand wallets and do you understand seed phrases and do you do you understand those things? Now that's a that's the first step, right? So people have to get over that hump. Not obvious, right? Because like people don't understand where is my Bitcoin? Is it stored inside the ledger somewhere? Is it like mm-hmm. <laughs> people people don't understand that, right? They have a hard time even understanding what it is. 
that it's well, being they're stored. comparing it to an existing experience right their well, yeah, idea I mean, their, their concept is my the money i see in my the banking the concept app is, is actually the wallet. At my bank. here's a wallet yeah, exactly. you know yeah this wallet has uh well i don't have any dollars in this wallet but it has it can't have dollars so if they leave they're either in the wallet they're out, out of the wallet <laughs> yes. but they're they're not in two wallets at the same time right mm -hmm. yeah that, that that doesn't exist with with cash right it's in one wallet but bitcoin can be in three wallets at the same time so you know, I think that's from a conceptual layer, conceptual level, people, a lot of people just don't understand that. Mm. And I think it takes a while to really understand that, to be yeah. honest. I don't, you know, I think a lot of people, and, and Bitcoin is particularly, uh, particularly tricky because they change the ad, you change the addresses, you know, the, the setup of Bitcoin is a little odd, you know, uh, I would say. Yeah, there's so, uh, there's so many layers to understanding as to why there's a lot, there's a lot of subtleties to, yeah. to to what Bitcoin is, right? Yeah. So I think you know it takes a certain uh, takes a while, but then there's then there's sort of the okay, well, why is this why is this thing why is this different from say Solana, right? Well, there's no there's no company behind it. There's no Solana Foundation. Bitcoin there is kind of Bitcoin Foundation, but there there's no foundation that's in charge of Bitcoin, right? So there's nobody who says, well, you know, we're going to change the rules of Bitcoin. We're going to do this. So that's another whole layer that I think people get really, uh, they have a hard time with. And uh, and I think, you know, I, I mean, I'm honestly, not that many people really understand it, to be honest. Yeah, but I, but they understand that, they they do understand that the price is going up. And they understand that people are saying this is the one. And so, you know, and they listen so to people why... like you and me, you know, and and they're, they're like, OK, these guys seem to be passionate about it. They seem to they seem to, you know, be articulating that this is different from some other cryptocurrency. So, no. you know. And so why do you how would you explain why this is such a big concept and the future of money like what why should people pay attention i saw you tweet you know like uh, so, something along the lines and i'm maybe butchering but you know like you have to pay attention like you cannot miss this like if you're missing this now it's just your own like right well look i mean I think that, you know you know it's it, it <laughs> if we're right right if we bitcoiners are right and i think i think we are right but like you know if this is going to become the future world money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then if you don't get involved at year 15 of the future of world money, you kind of missed uh, pretty much the biggest thing that, that that's going to change the world economy, you know, going forward. I, I don't see anything that's going to be bigger than that. Right. Because if, if, if the entire money supply changes to, to a world where we're running Bitcoin. And if that happens within the next, say, 20 years, um, well, the difference between you not getting involved now and getting involved 20 years from now is, I mean, it's, it's going to be completely night or day as to kind of whether you retire, for example. You know what I mean? You, yeah. you still may retire, but, you know, this, it's... Not, an amazing opportunity, right? <laughs> what? I wanted to say not as advertised. <laughs> not I, as advertised. Retire, right? I mean, not as mean, advertised. You can still survive. I mean, I, I think you'll do fine. But like, you know, it, it it's probably the single biggest wealth creation event for people, especially your age, is there's going to be one decision. Did, did, they, did they get orange build or not? Yeah. You know, so it's, why it's, do you think it's so hard for people? I, I totally agree. What I sometimes think is the fact that we are living in a time where something so big is developing, that's already hard for people to like get, right? Like big, big things that happened in history, they are history. We read about them, right? They seem far away from us. We, we seem far removed from that. But the fact that we are actually living through it, I think sometimes that's also what drives people to 
kind of like ignoring it or saying like, yeah, well, you're talking in this big way. It, that doesn't really make sense, right? They cannot just, they, they cannot, they are not able to wrap their head around the fact that this is the invention of a new, better money, basically, right? And something well, that creates... Gonna, which uh, is sort of the cornerstone of kind of, you know, government, economics, business, everything, right? Yes, So, exactly. you know, that's the thing is like, you said, well, so what, money, okay. So it's like a new PayPal. Okay, that does, that's not going to yeah. change the world, right? A new PayPal is not going to change the world, right? But yeah. a new thing where everybody's going to be stuck to the system of like really honest money where governments can't print and where, you know, everybody who does go into debt is going to, you just can't keep on racking up debts forever either. That's mm. fundamentally going to change everything. So I think it's, it's hard to, I think it, you can understand that it's going to happen, but I think it's so, it's, it's so uh, revolutionary that I think most people think, yeah, it can't possibly happen. Uh, uh, but not in exactly. my lifetime, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're like, yeah. And, and I think, you know, you know, I was having this conversation on spaces with some, some people from uh, Europe, from England. And they're like, well, you know, people, a lot of people in Europe sort of believe that the government's going to take care of them, right? Like the government's going to provide my pension. The government's going to do this. Government's going to take care of me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's probably an incorrect assumption. You know, we're seeing that in the same thing in the U.S. You know, government's going to pay, pay for my Social Security. No, the government's not going <laughs> to. There will not be any Social Security. You do, you, that's just a lie, you know. Mm. For you the know, next, you're paying for it. In America for the next 300 years, probably. <laughs> Maybe I'm longer. Sorry? In America, probably for for the next three four hundred years, if you look at you know how many trillion of unfunded liabilities. Yeah, I mean right? they can't. Like, uh, they, well, they just can't pay it. That's never going to yeah, be exactly. Paid. And, and they yeah. can't. And those Medicare be benefits and the Social Security benefits are not. They they do not have money for that. Mm. And so the system is kind of bankrupt, but we're all pretending that it's not. Yeah. And so there's got to be there's got to be a fundamental change to the system. And that change is coming, and, and Bitcoin is going to be part of that change, right? So it, it's a really big change, and I think a lot of people would rather, you know, it's a little bit like thinking about your, your own death, right? It's not particularly pleasant thinking <laughs> that you're not going to be around, you know, 100 years from now, but yeah. you're not going to be around 100 years from now. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, and it doesn't uh, make it less true, right? So your feeling about it doesn't, about make, it it doesn't make it true. You're exactly. still... A, there's nobody has ever lived beyond 123 years old. That's the maximum a human being. And, you know, we've had, you know, 10 billion of us kind of walk the earth and nobody's mm -hmm. lived beyond 123 that we, that in recorded history. And yeah. look, I think we're going to, this system is also going to fail. And, uh, and, you know, I, I, if not thinking about it, doesn't, doesn't make it not, happen so it, exactly. it's going to happen and yeah. uh and kind of bitcoin's your solution you know and you know it's just a question of how much do you want to hedge your bets maybe you maybe you sort of say well okay fred i kind of 10 percent believe you okay great well 10 percent's probably probably enough you don't you don't need to be a hundred percent believer you know you just mm. you need to be a little bit of a believer you know yeah. We're still sufficiently early that if you kind of believe a little bit, I think you're going to be okay. Yeah. You don't have to put but, all your eggs in the Bitcoin basket, but you know, it, it, it really makes no sense to have no coins. I think at this point, yeah. I think the fact that this is so big combined with the weird perception of people that it's too late and all these things that I think that makes a lot of people not pay attention, right? Like, uh, well, because Bram and Fred are talking about it. Yeah. They're only talking about it because they have Bitcoin, by the way, I always then think, right. Of course, th that is my skin in the game. It, it would be weird if I didn't have Bitcoin and talked about how good Bitcoin was, but anyway, but the point is more like people think they are 
too late, but how are you too late to a new money, right? And that kind of ties into like how big well, I think, can you, you think? Know, look, like I how think far can of, you zoom out? I think part of the thing is, look, you, you, it's, it's hard without looking at sort of quantitative numbers of uh, mm-hmm. how, how, how much this is catching on, you know? And that's yeah. one of the things I've been kind of doing on Twitter recently is I've, I really, you know, I really been focusing on kind of trying to explain to people about these power laws and not, not just about power laws of price, but like power laws of adoption, right? So, you know, Bitcoin at the end of the day, it is growing almost exponentially. It's, it's yeah. growing like a weed. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and basically, you know, 25% a year, there's more Bitcoin users every year. And it doesn't matter whether Bitcoin's going, price is going up or down, the usage is increasing, right? And there's all these ways of measuring that. You can measure people who have one Bitcoin or people who have ha- uh, one tenth of a Bitcoin or addresses that have um, a hundredth of a Bitcoin or even addresses that have 10 Bitcoin. And you see these, these things are growing at, at sort of a geometric rate, right? And yeah. so there's, you know, it really is, there is no uncertainty about it. It's just this thing's growing. It's sort of like population growth in a country like, you know, India, right? Mm-hmm. Population growth in Netherlands is not growing, but population in India is growing or Mexico. It's growing every year. It's growing, at, you know, whatever, 7% a year. Yeah. And, you know, I think the we're dealing with sort of an inevitability of the growth and adoption of Bitcoin. That that's, that's the, that's really the basis. Now, this is also growing in terms of price. It's also growing in a very consistent way, but it's a little harder to really um, appreciate and understand that because it's happening in this logarithmic kind of way. And mm. lo- we have very bad intuition for logarithmic growth. Can you explain you know? a bit on that? Like what, yeah, what so, is the main okay, thing so to let, understand? Let's just or... say if people, like if you ask most people who are not in Bitcoin or even people who are in Bitcoin, you say, explain explain the price of Bitcoin. They'd be like, well, there was back in the day, a long, long time ago, Bitcoin was really cheap, right? Like mm-hmm. you were saying, right? I, you know, 2013, it was like a couple hundred dollars, right? You can buy Bitcoin for $200, right? Um, and then, so there was this prehistory where it was very cheap. And then in 2017, it kind of went from $1,000 to $20,000, right? Almost 20000 Then it crashed. And then it was like dead. And then it went in late 2020, it rose again from the dead. And it went to $60,000. And then it stayed there for about a year, went down and went back up. It hit 60,000, 69,000 in the second peak. Then it crashed. And then it did nothing for three years. It died. And then last year it went back up. Well, that Mm. doesn't sound like a, like a straight line at all, right? Like, (laughs) no, that, that's not, that sort of like sounds like a very risky kind of investment that, probably too risky for most people, right? Like, especially somebody my age, right? They'd be like, yeah, I don't need that. That sounds like way too much volatile, just complete risky casino, you know? Um, But if you look at it on logarithmic space and you say, great, let's look at the logarithm of Bitcoin price, right? Which the logarithm is is a a good way that you can put a a graph of Bitcoin price over a very wide time scale, right? So from when Bitcoin was at 10 cents, right? So the logarithm is negative one at 10 cents, right? To right now where Bitcoin, let's say it's roughly $100,000, not quite 100,000 yet, but Mm -hmm. you know, 100,000 would be 10 to the power six. So the logarithm of it in base 10 is six. So you went from minus one to plus six, right? Yeah. So you look at that and now the trick is Look at time also on a logarithmic basis. So look at time starting at the Genesis block and 15 years from that, from there. So 10 years that that's one, right? Because 10 to the power mm-hmm. one, 10 to the power mm-hmm. 
one is 10, right? And so, you know, you start at zero, you go to a little bit beyond one. Now you're at, you know, 1.4, right? Or 1.3, you know? And so if you look at time that way and logarithm of price, now you see, whoa, it's a complete straight line. Yeah. It's very clear. Once you see it, you're like, I can't unsee that. It's completely a straight line. And now it wobbles around the straight line, but it's very clear that it's growing linearly. Not possible that it's random, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, there's not, you know, not that many people have seen that graph, including not that many Bitcoiners, right? Yeah. Um, and so once you see that graph, you're like, oh, hmm, that's odd. Wow. Well, why is this thing that went up from 10 cents to 100,000? So it went up seven orders of magnitude, right? Yeah. How, how can something that grow up in such a consistent way? And the answer is it's a power law. It's, it's, it, it's part of these power laws that exist in nature uh, all over the place, right? Yeah. And so. Yeah. Sorry to ask you a question about it. Like I'm, I'm talking to uh, Giovanni uh, Santos oh, yeah, in, in, in two days, so that's great. So we'll sure. dive deeper. But I think the essence of the power law is like uh, I think there's there's a great example, and I want to say it correctly, but I think it's like the like how the size of the heart of an animal is correlated to its weight or its size in a certain way, right? Like that. Eventually yeah. So also, if you look at stuff like you, that, or like how the, the mass, the mass of an element of an ant the mass of an animal, right? Mm. Measured in kilograms, right? Yeah. And you measure the logarithm of the mass of an animal. And on the other axis, you put the metabolic rate, which is how much energy oh, that does that yeah. animal need to stay alive, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out you need 100 watts to stay alive. Mm. So you, you require, you and I both require about the same amount of energy as a light bulb. To keep yeah. going, right? Yeah, and all this food is just to produce 100 watts. That's it. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you look at that relative to time, you'll see that it's a three quarter power. So it's a sublinear um, growth, right? It's a sublinear power law, and uh, that. So if you can, if you double the size of the animal, you do not double the um, you only have to you only increase the uh, metabolic rate by seventy five percent, right? Yeah. So yeah. the bigger the animal, the more efficient it is, and it yeah. it actually it works for, you know, even like bacteria all the way up to like blue whales. Yeah, and, and there's just, it, also all examples of the line. yeah, and there's also examples of how cities grow and their GDP or Everything. amount of just, businesses, yeah, like even stuff number like that, of right? patents. Per capita, for example, things like that, right? Wow, but yeah. And so the 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 biggest question I have there, I think, what I like about it, and it's also why I started talking to Giovanni. I saw his post on Reddit, and then well, I I'm went happy down, that you're talking to him. It's great. I went down the power law rabbit hole, which was yeah, yeah great, fascinating. So, but what I find difficult with Bitcoin, and I hope to formulate the question right like i see it as of course it's a network growing right it's a network of participants um growing so it's kind of like similar to perhaps kind of like morse law type type ish but where where does the power law of bitcoin come from is that because it's basically like a mind virus it's like a social adoption thing is it a human behavior type of element there or is it because Bitcoin is so rooted in in math and physics as well. Like just how how that is engineered does does it make any sense to identify those two, or like how how do you see that? Because that's well, kind of yeah, the thing I mean, where look, I think. Why like, why would the number yeah. of patents per user why why would the number of patents increase sublinearly with the amount of users? It does. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, it's superlinearly. So the amount of patents grows by twenty percent. It's true. It's a fact. It's a fact, right? Why is that? So why why do these numbers show up? I don't know. It's just a normal growth kind of curve. Everything has either they grow sublinearly or superlinearly at some rate, 
Yeah, um, but is it irrelevant then to talk about this human behavior? Because the one thing I think about with the power laws of Bitcoin, right? Let's say the, in this bull run, we go to 500K plus, right? Yeah. There will be a bigger number of people that will pay attention to Bitcoin because of that than the amount of people that did at, you know, 10 cents to uh, $10 or whatever. Probably right? not, but there will be. But well, not that's relevant. the point. That's the point, right? Not on a percentage basis, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So actually what these power laws suggest is that there's nothing new under the sun, right? So yeah. and everybody's like, well, ETFs are big, Fred. Like, I'm like, well, so was Mt. Gox when it came out, right? That was a big thing for Bitcoin to have an exchange, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or but at that the, point, the, within that context, with that amount of users, you say like, exactly, so it's not right? about the absolute numbers. It's more about the no. percentages. Yeah, it's okay. a, look, all these things, just, it doesn't really matter that there is now ETFs or it seems like that it's just a general function of time that doesn't depend on anything else. There's only one variable in it, which is time. That's the only variable. Yeah. So basically, There's nothing long, else. Yeah, so this is what Jeff Booth says, right? As long as it stays decentralized and secure, it will be chugging along and people will adopt it as it goes, basically. Yeah, is, I mean, is... it's there's nothing there's nothing you or I can do that's going to change that or mm -hmm. or anybody else or ETFs or it's just a normal growth pattern, right? Yeah. And okay. I feel like, you know, the question is is sort of why is it a power law? Well, because I think it's kind of a natural type phenomenon, right? It's a it's a network type thing, but it's it's like cities are networks or you know, animals are networks, we're networks of cells, right? That's kind of what we are. We're you know, we have we have all these little cells that make us up, trillions of them. Mm. And for those cells, we we don't exist, right? They're just like they're doing their own thing. Exactly. And, yeah, that's true. You know, and so Bitcoin itself is you know the growth of bitcoin as as a store of value and so it's it, it's just it clearly has its own clear path uh and other other cryptocurrencies don't right so if you look mm -hmm. at litecoin for example the price of litecoin is not a power law okay right and i mean the price of litecoin it, litecoin was is lower than it was in 2017 right now. Yeah. It's, but, and would you the agree that- The of Litecoin is not growing as a power law, so, yeah. you know. But would you agree then, do, do you agree then that the price is like a proxy of the adoption also, or not? I think, yeah, I think there's all, there's, there's, that's the crazy thing, which is that the price of Bitcoin was known to be a power law first, right? But then, you know, uh, uh, the hash rate of Bitcoin is also a power law. And furthermore, the the amount of the usage of Bitcoin is a power law. So there's all the, there's power laws everywhere in Bitcoin. It's not just price. It's there's all all kinds of power laws. In fact, there's even power laws of power laws. So if you look at the amount of Bitcoin. Uh, that the growth rate of Bitcoin uh, for Bitcoin wallets having one Bitcoin, one tenth of a Bitcoin, one hundredth of a Bitcoin, etc. That's also a power law of, yeah. of Bitcoin. It, it, what I'm just trying to say is there's all these in, intrinsic power laws, which just tell you that you're looking at a network. You're, yeah. you're looking at this growth of a network and there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. And there's power laws at every single one of those points, right? Whether it's hash rate, whether it's usage, whether it's price, it's all connected. And so what's the biggest difference with like the classic S curve of, of technology adoption then here? Like, is that something we should let go? I mean, there's people that no, also follow I that. No, I mean, it's probably ultimately going to be an S curve, right? But we're still in the very early phases, right? So, you know. I would say roughly speaking of kind of like, how close are we to the end? 1%, you know? Yeah, we yeah we are at 1%, you mean? Yeah, so. yeah maybe, okay. maybe not even 1%, right? 
So, yeah, I agree with I agree. So when so you look is at it too early to talk about S curve adoption then. But Right. Well, well, a friend of mine, Stephen Perinode, he's you know, he's an astrophysicist, right? And he's actually even modeled like S curves that actually look like power laws in the very early phase. Hmm. They're identical to power laws, and then they turn into S curves, right? So you okay. can model these things with an S curve, but realistically we're probably 10 years away from the S curve stuff, even starting to become an S, you know, it looks, mm. it looks like that. And then it sort of has an inflection point in bends, right? Yeah. But we're not to that. We're not even to the, we're still in the very early phases. Um, you know, so we're 1% of the way in, I mean, realistically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And probably in terms of time where, you know, we probably have at least one decade before we stop power law growth at all. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to grow invest... pretty much exponentially for the next yep. decade. I mean, very close to exponential. And would this be your main argument against people who say, you know, Bitcoin is too volatile for to be a predictable a predictable store of value? It kind of depends on what your time frame is then, right? If No, I mean, I think it's sort of like this. It's sort of like, here's the thing. Let's... If you took, if you, um, if you're looking at an asset that is sort of growing at some linear rate, right, and it, it's oscillating around this linear rate, I would say, yeah, it's way too volatile, right? Like, why would I want an asset if I said, okay, uh, I'm gonna, you can either invest in something that's going to go up ten percent a year, almost guaranteed. Right. Mm. Or you can get an asset that's going to grow 40% a year, plus or minus 40, 40%. <laughs> now yeah. you're like, well, I'll take the 10%. Now I'll take the 10% mm. for sure. Right. Like my house on the canals in Netherlands. Right. That thing's probably going to grow up 10% a year, maybe 7%. Mm. Right. That sounds a lot safer than something that's going to might go down 40%. Right. But that's not the correct way of looking at it. It's not like, it's a linear thing that's going to be, it's actually an exponential thing, right? So because it's exponential, not linear, right? It's not just volatility around a linear path. It's volatility around an exponential path. So if somebody said, well, you have this exponential asset, which has some volatility around an exponential path. Do you want that? You should be like, of course I want that. It's great. Like, yeah. this thing's going to be the next Microsoft, right? I'm buying Microsoft in 1986. Great. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care what the volatility is if I buy Microsoft at eight, around 86. You know, Microsoft went up, you know, 3,000 times from 1986 till now. Yeah. You know, so Bitcoin is, 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 it's on a very high growth trajectory, right? And it's not just a linear growth. It's, it's going to grow a lot, compounded really high. Right. Hmm. So, you know, this is something that's going to go up 10 X, 20 X from where we are now. And so because yeah. it's going to go up 10 X, 20 X, you're going to get a massive amount of volatility because it's growing at the super linear way, you know, not just hmm. even X squared. It's growing at X to the power six. So, <laughs> you know, if you see something that's growing at X to the power six, you absolutely should own that thing. Yeah. Right. So what? It's just you. You just have to get it in your head. This thing's growing at X to the power six. Okay, I'm going to own that thing. You know. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's a, that's <laughs> huge. So what do you think about then? Last question about this. Like people talk a lot about you know diminishing returns. Like if they look at the previous cycles, you see like uh, it was like third. I don't know. X thousand percent up, then X hundred percent up, then like hundred ten percent up. Now, is that gonna go down? Because, like in my mind, I think, I, I, I think the, I don't know if they are gonna go down because at one point, if the adoption grows and people understand what this is, my logical reasoning is less people will sell into, you know, the bull, you know, the boom and bust that that will follow each other? Like how, well, how do you I mean, I can that? tell you what statistically it's doing, right? Statistically, the volatility, well, it's growing at an exponential rate. The, the, 
a, a quasi exponential rate. So a power law is very similar to an exponential rate, except the exponential uh, curve is growing down. So in 2017, like the growth like rate was 100%. Yeah. Now the growth yeah. rate is like 45%. Mm -hmm. Okay. In 20 years, the growth rate will be 20%. That's kind of what the, the power law tells you. So it's still going to be 30% growth in, you know, in 10 years. So it's, it's still so, so it's a still going to be a very, very high growth thing for 10 years. Yeah. You know, you, you're getting a very, very high growth thing. The volatility is going down a little bit, but not that much, right? So the volatility has gone from 0.3 in log terms to 0.25, not even that much. So I think that realistically, we can expect, um, you know, high, uh, high volatility and high growth for the next decade. Yeah. And by the way, because we're now looking at these numbers on a much bigger scale, you know, I think it's going to look like it's going to be crazy. I mean, it's going to be like Bitcoin went from 500,000 to 200,000. You know what I mean? That's going to appear like people are just not going to get their, their heads around that. Because it's going to seem so crazy going from 500,000 to 200,000. But that's only, you know, that's one standard deviation, right? That's like one standard deviation is I dropped by half. Yeah. Okay. That's not not terrible. You know what I mean? Especially I think, if, uh, I, if I overshot on the upside, I might go from 500,000 to 125,000. Yeah. I think that's and, what Giovanni says too, right? Like his downside is like, half of the of, of the trend line and his upside is like right, 1.5 exactly. ish or something right yeah yeah but i mean we could go you know we could go well above the trend line right we could go two times mm -hmm. there's twice we've gone 2x the trend line yeah which then puts a downside to 75 percent drop yeah. right yeah. so you could go down you know you could go up conceivably to 500,000, then drop to 125,000. It's really hard to get an intuitive number without looking at the, the actual math and looking at mm -hmm. the thing in, in log space. Your intuition will be wrong all the time. Yeah. Well, I think so, this is a great tool to help you remember uh, what this is, right? To emphasize what this is, because I think you can study Bitcoin and you get to a certain understanding. I mean, this is what I do. Like I... I still feel it when the price goes down a bit, but then I just reiterate like, oh, this is the stuff I know and nothing's changed, right? Like nothing fundamentally well, changed. It's sort of like, with this, it's the learn, same thing. If you learn to fly a plane, you, you have to learn to trust the instruments a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or driving a car. You you know, you're, you look at the speedometer, you look at like the RPM, you sort of see, you have to like trust a little bit in like, okay, you, this is this is what I the past behavior. This is what I expect. Now I I have to learn to trust the instruments a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's that's where you're going to get freaked out if you if you don't have any basis for this stuff. You're just gonna you're just gonna be like, okay, went down a lot. Yeah, Looks like I'm it's out. going to zero. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, so, I have another. I have another subject. I I saw yeah. you tweet about uh, gold, and you know some people argue against Bitcoin and say you know at least you can hold gold physically and you can store it physically. Like you cannot do that with Bitcoin. Like I would argue that Bitcoin is like metaphysical, you know. But in fact, it's also tangible because you know it it's verifiably it's just math and the fact that letters and numbers represent all the Bitcoin there is. Like. In some way, it is tangible, and I can write down a private key with a pen on a paper, and that can represent real. Like you can hold a billion dollars in your hands. Like how how do you view this when people say this? Like I, I mean, I, it just seems to me the person who said that is is the head of Goldman Sachs's wealth management unit. Well, what else? So would say, it's but, like okay. something is <laughs> wrong if he thinks that you can't hold Bitcoin. I, it just to me, it's like it's insane that somebody who has that position, right? Who's advising literally trillions of dollars of money mm -hmm. that is that she does not understand even that you can hold Bitcoin in a wallet. Yeah. So it's, 
you know, it's uh, it's the amount of of just lack of understanding is just unbelievable to me. You know, but it's, is this uh, is this as a Wall Street veteran? Is this yeah. on purpose? Like, do they not understand? Like, I I agree, right? Like, if this is your life, if this is your work, and there's a new form of money. Yeah, that is adopted by your biggest competitors in a sense. How how I I can I, I mean I worked in TradFi as well. I cannot imagine there's a research team researching this, right? Like, it, it, are they so ignorant? Yeah, really. They, they're completely or, or is ignorant. this they, is this just show? Look, like what else know, would I, they say? I, That's I, what I mean. Like, is, you know, there's a lot of people who who don't they don't like to get their hands dirty. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you a funny story. I sold a company to uh, a social network to Viacom. Okay, you know, it was a pretty significant, you know, amount of money, like mid eight figures. You know, and uh, you know, and I talked to the CFO of Viacom. Viacom's MTV, right? And I'm like, "Have you ever tried our product?" And he's like, "No." I go, "I like." I'm like, he goes, no, I don't do that. I don't actually try things. And I'm like, I know, but I've been, I've been like in due diligence for like six months with you. We do all these meetings. You do this, you know, dozens of lawyers, all this stuff. You, we've worked on all these fine prints of this. I've, uh, have you never even actually created a profile? I don't care if it's a real one under your own name or whatever, but have you, you go, no, absolutely not. I don't, I'm not a guy doing social networking. And I think the same thing is true for Goldman Sachs. I mean, I guarantee you that woman has not created a Bitcoin wallet. Now, mm -hmm. she can pontificate all she wants about Bitcoin wallets, but she doesn't know what a Bitcoin wallet is. She's never actually stored Bitcoin. Otherwise, she wouldn't be saying that. She, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a typical, you know... I, I'll leave that to some younger people. They'll they'll do the actual work. I'll just look at read some article, and I'll make some statements. Yeah. So, but how? Yeah. Well, how do you view BlackRock getting into this? Like, my idea here is, I I kind of see the 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 Bitcoin adoption of well, at least a part of Wall Street, kind of like a, a Trojan horse in a sense. Like for me, it's very fascinating that a a huge winner of the fiat financial system you know is already one leg into this new money system i mean like usually the winners move last right they cash they milk their cash cow and then they move on kind of like well this goldman sachs uh, lady or vanguard right like these people they right. they they're just pushing this away but i think that's what british huddle i heard him once say like if you don't think there's like a a team of 50 people figuring out what this Bitcoin thing is for the past two years or five years at BlackRock, you know, you're crazy. And I, I definitely agree. Like they totally understand what this is. Of course they can make money off it. So they make a product for it, etc. But still the fact that they actually moved here for me is a very big signal because the winners usually move last, right? Like, how, so how do you see this comparison to like these, these, Firms that don't move and actually talk against it, and these other firms. Well, if you hear Larry Fink talk, it's wild. Yeah, it's totally. Well, especially, especially if you listen to him talk like five years ago. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So he completely has one eighty. You know, uh, apparently it's some young guy working at BlackRock who who Orange built him. Yeah. You Mitch know, Nick. So, Mitch Nick. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, look, I think it's, you know, it is like this. It's somebody, you know, it's a personal thing. You know, I think Larry Fink personally got it. You know, he personally mm. understood this stuff, whereas I don't think he personally understood it five years ago. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, I do think uh, I do think he 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 was orange filled in the in, in the kind of conventional sense. And he was like, ah, oh, hmm. OK. And not just for Bitcoin, right? But I think, like you know, he he has this idea of tokenization and you know stocks what and else? so on, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, on the blockchain, which you know I I don't think even is a bad idea long, longer term. But what I'm saying is, like, I think 
I think he he realized that this is this is this is the future, and he better get on board and own this future. Yeah. Uh, before somebody else decides to do it to him. Yeah. So. Well, you know. maybe easier in some sense for him that he's the founder of this firm, of course, and then you know the woman at Goldman Sachs or the CEO of Vanguard is not. So maybe there's also a different kind of like structure there, of course, as to how. I mean, I've met Larry Fink. I mean, I <laughs> I actually worked for him for a day, you know. Mm. So back Fun. in the day, so yeah, yeah. So look, I mean, he's he's a very very smart guy, and you know he is. Um, he is uh he's a visionary not just and he's a visionary he was a visionary in terms of uh financialization of assets you know creating the first cmo uh that was that was an absolutely masterful move you know doing that with Lou Ranieri, who was at solomon at the time where i was and um you know and then embracing ETFs, you know, and buying iShares. He bought iShares from Barclay, right? Mm. So, um, you know, that was <laughs> seeing that ETFs were the future was was you know critical, right? And so I think, you know, it, it's 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 similar to Bezos realizing that e-commerce is going to be huge, right? But when he did, yeah, I think, yeah, you know, I think. He has the right view of, wait a second, what's the most important thing? ETFs are the most important thing. Boom. I'm going to, I'm going to get an ETFs. I'm going to provide super low cost friction ETFs for everything. Yeah. Brilliant. So, I mean, that's, you know, he, 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 he saw that he did that. Right. And that's what kind of BlackRock made its mark really, you know, as you know, the ETF, uh, super store, yeah. right. Well, and if you keep on this view of, of th that you have of Larry Fink, like I have a, I don't know if it's a strange theory, but I have a certain theory and maybe it's too big and it doesn't make sense. But what I'm thinking from my point of view, but I think you can add to this, like the, the you know, the speculative attack story of George Soros and the Bank of England, right? Yeah. Um, Larry Fink knows what's up with the dollar, I assume, right? He totally understands this, right? Would you say, could this already be like some sort of speculative attack on the dollar in a sense that he has this like one leg in this new money system that let's say when the dollar actually breaks that he is already with one leg in a certain lifeboat, which also gives him a certain amount of influence, right? I mean, yesterday we saw the U.S. government again sell 30,000 Bitcoin, like they're, they're, they're well, selling he, it like crazy. Could this be something more... like that? Look, he knows more than anybody else, right? Because kind of when QE happened, right? And then when, when yeah. you know, the latest kind of, you know, uh, the latest version of QE came, they said, hey, BlackRock, you're going to do all the uh, bond buying for us, right? You know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. so he, he's he got the front row seat. So he sees exactly. the problem way before we do and, and much closer than we do. So yeah, I, I don't I don't know if he's trying to attack the dollar so much as I think he has a better view of kind of the problems in the current system than than anybody. Yeah, and, and uh, I think um, you know I think he realizes that this is going to be a very very significant asset class for the next ten years. I think that these guys think. 10 years in advance, you know? And I think mm -hmm. it's sort of like the Japanese used to do those, you know, five-year plans and stuff. I think they've now shifted. They're like, okay, Bitcoin and and crypto, right? I think he's definitely thinking both. And, you know, tokenization, you know, let's, let's see, you know, if they don't allow ETH this year, fine. We'll just wait until next year or two years from now when they, you know, maybe it's a new head of the SEC, maybe it's a new president, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I definitely think that, um, I mean, I think he's in it for the long game, right? Yeah. And, and so. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think yeah, perhaps attack was a, was a, was not really a, attack. Was a too hard thinking... word. It was a too hard word, but it's, it's, uh, it is a certain strategy against it, I'd say, if you adopt 
this new money, right? But it's just interesting to think about. I think it's just interesting. He moved anyway. So, um, yeah, for me, that's a big signal. But I, I definitely think that if you had any question about whether it's going to be, is Bitcoin going to survive? The fact that BlackRock has put their, you know, their stake in the ground tells you that 100% is going to survive. Like, oh. yeah. There's no doubt in my mind, right? Yeah, that, yeah, I agree. And this is also the, how I always saw Bitcoin. It's an, it, well, it was an experiment, I'd say, and it, it would was. go to zero or it would be like the black hole value type theory. And it's not going to to zero anymore. So I agree with that. But uh, yeah, I think the outlook should be long, right? You should have like a long-term vision. And that's actually, I want to ask you a question about this because I saw you tweeted something that I really agreed with and you said i was a tradfi uh, degan like a degenerate then yeah. slowly i kicked the habit and instead of trading or making bets i moved into long-term investing yeah. i also saw that you had like a crypto related project before with a token i mean i made a crypto market research platform that that failed before you know uh, like yeah. like we dabbled around in this too but how did you move from being a degan <laughs> a degenerate to well, being like a long-term investor, etc. You know, I, I what, built what a your wallet lesson? for crypto, you know, called Lynx. And so I was very, and I was convinced back in 2018, 2019, that, you know, if the sort of the multi-coin Solana type thesis, fast, super fast, blah, 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 is, mm -hmm. is good. Uh, I'm still not anti-token or anti any of these things. I think, you know, I'm not, I just think that, uh, I'm I'm sort of a I'm a Bitcoin maximalist in that I think no other coin is going to is going to be money, right? It, there's no there's no possibility that you know people start you know having prices in ETH in the next ten years. You know that's that's yeah. nobody's going to do oil settlements in ETH. It's just not mm -hmm. going to happen, right? Or or Solana or anything else, right? Those are not going to become world money. They are going to be useful. There's a lot of use for some things like this. Um, they're just not money, right? And so the way I look at it is, um, you know, a lot of these things are actually useful for, and I mean, even NFTs are quite, people like them, right? They're, they're useful. They can, be, they can be used for art. They can be used for, for a lot of things, potentially, right? We're still at the very beginning of that. And, you know, like Larry Fink's vision of tokenization, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend who's doing, you know, a property thing, Natalie uh, from Proppy, right? She's doing, you know, real estate on the blockchain. You know, it's still very early days, but she's doing it. She's, you know, mm -hmm. they've, they've had apartment buildings or houses that have been sold, you know, entirely, entirely. The whole, the whole chain of command is, you know, title everything on, on blockchain. So I, I'm not anti-token, and I think... You know, a lot of people are saying, well, Fred, you're a maxi. You can't support other tokens. No, you can. It's just, I, I just don't think they're going to compete for money, right? Um, That's a different thing. They're a different thing, and it's a much smaller thing, right? Like, to me, like, creating a new form of money for the entire planet, well, that's, you know, that's a $100 trillion prize, right? Now, creating a token for nfts i don't know maybe that's a couple hundred million maybe you know like if you're if you're lucky like open sea you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah it's not to say it's bad you can certainly do it um but I, I i think it's not i think the you know you have to look at what's where is the eye on the price you know so i yeah. think you know and and, and i think the 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 big the big prize is bitcoin right that's the prize is money now if you have a five percent of your money is spread around a bunch of stuff you buy some nfts for art do whatever you want fine great do that you know what i mean like i'm not i'm not a a maximalist in the kind of spanish inquisition sense of the word you know i i don't i don't want to like sorry man you bought an nft bad like no <laughs> buy an app buy a little eat so what you know use metamask it's not the end of the world right mm. but i 
I don't think it's it's a great use of your money to invest, especially if somebody doesn't own any Bitcoin, if they're buying some meme coin or something else. Yeah. It's kind of a mistake, right? Now, you know, if if you own a lot of Bitcoin and you're also like playing around, you want to do something else, you want to buy Dogecoin, fine. Buy Dogecoin, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. have fun, you know, like... It, it, yeah, it should, it's you should view it in... You should view it in different ways, I think. Like, you have I mean, to view it in different ways. And yeah. also it's like, and the other part of being a DGEN is trying to time Bitcoin. Like really bad idea, I think. Mm. Yeah, I agree. You know, like try, trying to buy and sell Bitcoin constantly is just a, not a good idea. Right? Why do you think people are so degenerate with their money or like on this gambling vibe in a sense? Like why... Why is you that? You know, I think I think he, people seem to think that they can outsmart the market. You know, and mm. and I think it I think it's a combination of greed and fear. You know, I think people people think, oh, uh, I'm going to be able to sell Bitcoin and then buy it back cheaper. Well, generally speaking, I did that, when, I did that twice. Yeah. Two times bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there you so, go. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think generally speaking, if you sell it, uh, you're probably not going to be able to buy it back cheaper, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, you you probably think you will, but then it, it'll go down. Maybe it'll go down, but then you're going to be convince yourself that you shouldn't buy it until it goes yeah. back up above where you bought it. And then you're <laughs> going to be like, oh, damn. Yeah. 100%. You know, so... I just don't. I think psychologically, it, it's 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 a really bad idea to kind of actively trade this stuff. I mm -hmm. don't think it's a terrible idea to spend your Bitcoin. You know, like you know, uh, ultimately, you ultimately you're going to be spending it somehow, right? You're going to be using it to to do something with it, right? But that's mm -hmm. different than trying to sell it and buy it back, right? Yeah. So if if I'm like okay great now it's time for me to buy a house because I just got married and and I need to sell a little bit of my Bitcoin to buy the house okay well sell yeah. a little bit of Bitcoin I mean you got to live you got to you know what I mean I I I think that makes sense um, and you know I think make you know try to postpone it as much as you can but you know also you're going <laughs> to live you know you're not living yeah. forever anyways you know so that's true. But you what know, would be I, your biggest what would be your biggest tip for someone like how can someone develop a, this long term view and basically also like trust themselves with their understanding of well we're talking about bitcoin right but at one point you i think the goal think is the to get to that don't point, use right? leverage do not use leverage right yeah because if you're if you have too much of something if you're using leverage i think you're going to your psychologically you can you can get wrecked too easily the second thing is i wouldn't put all your money in bitcoin and the reason i say that is um i still think your best percentage it the best per kind of percentage of your asset like even fully invested to me i think that's like 70 percent bitcoin you know what i mean like even if i'm a young person i would keep 30 percent in cash mm. i'd actually put it in like something super safe like a bank account you know and the reason is, is that there's always unexpected things in life, you know, like whether it's, you know, you, you get sick, you get hit by a car, something, you know, something happens, you know, you have a kid and the kid needs some operation or something, right? Yeah. And, uh, or you lose your job, right? And you have three months where you're not working, right? I think, um, I think a lot of especially a lot of young people underestimate those risks and those risks are real. So having cash that you can sell that you can use uh, beyond just Bitcoin is, is good because you never know if, if something happens like that and you, you get caught in like 2022, you're going to sell all your Bitcoin mm. right to pay for it. Yeah. So, I agree. I don't think it's a great, I, I mean, I think you have to realize that things can, you know, 
things can happen and it's good. To, and so, you know, one of the things that I've done in my life is I've always had a very barbell strategy, you know, where I have some stuff that's very risky, like a startup, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that's risky and takes cash. And then I have a lot of cash on the side, too, you know, just because, you know, I don't I don't need to have like if you're 70 percent in Bitcoin, you can have all the rest in cash. No problem. You don't need to invest the rest, put yeah. the rest in the bank account. You know what I mean? Well, I'm at 90, 10. So, OK, well, 90, 10 <laughs> it, it, look, it's like. If you can handle 90-10, good. It depends, like, if you have a job and you have everything else, you, you know, 90-10 is probably okay. If you don't, you know, if you're just, like, counting on this Bitcoin, and you, I just think a lot of people are cutting it a little too close to the edge, you mm -hmm. know? And yeah. You have to, it's a personal decision, but that's, that's, I think, a tip that I would say is don't, you know, don't try to optimize too much and... um And I would say, uh, I think these power laws and stuff are, are, are good for giving people a little bit more perspective on, like, numbers. <laughs> yeah. Not for trading so much, but just like, you know, like, to give you a little bit of belief, to reinforce your belief that, wait a second, if I wait five years, is this thing really going to be much higher? Probably will, right? Probably it's yeah. going to be triple where it is today, or yeah. more. It may, it may be quadruple, right? But like, um, you know, I, th I think a lot of that is just giving you the conviction that you need to hold something. Uh, you know, because no matter what, Bitcoin can go down 10% in a day. And we saw it the other day, right? Yeah. So, you know, things, things can move a lot. And... And uh, and 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 not getting freaked out about it is is I think. Now, having said that, I, I you know another tool is just you know dollar dollar cost average. You know, like if you are if you do have cash coming in regularly, well, great, just plop that cash into Bitcoin. You know, yeah, that's yeah. another good tool because then you don't have to think about it too much, right? So it's like. Oh, I just made a thousand dollars. Great, I'll just put put it in Bitcoin, right? Yeah, just view it as a savings vehicle, right? Yeah, I it think it's like I, a savings vehicle, right? Yeah, and, and I think I that makes to total sense for especially yeah. for a young person right now. Like, I think that's that's a lot of uh, that's a good thing. And yeah. I would say the other thing is just you know, and this is something I think you become more as a Bitcoiner. You start realizing that having Bitcoin is such a good thing to have. That you you know you 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 cut down on sort of stupid expenses. Yes. Right. <laughs> Maybe I don't need a new car. You know. Yes. Maybe I can live in my current wherever I'm living without upgrading that. You know. Yeah. I mean, That's I think a buying a house, effect. for example, is probably a. You know, like, look, I own my house, but I wouldn't. If I was doing it right now today, and I was, especially if I was younger, I would definitely rent for five years as opposed to buying a house right now. Yeah. I, I think it's that, interesting you know, that, that this, this is what a lot of people experience. This more, the kind of like this, this, this frugality in some sense, they become more frugal or at least more aware of what things cost or what is the value of something that I buy? Like, does it add value to my life, you know, stuff, stuff like that. You become more. Uh, yeah. And there's that. one other thing I would say is start thinking in Bitcoin. Yeah. How you much Bitcoin I mean? is like, this? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. think in terms of, I have, you know, so much dollars, but mm -hmm. just think I, I've got so much, I got three Bitcoin. Okay. I got, I got 3.1 Bitcoin, you know, I just, yeah. I, I want to get to four, you know, like, how do I get to four? Like, I, you know, that's and also, if you think about that big purchase, right. If you put yeah. that in, price that into Bitcoin. I would um, definitely think in Bitcoin. I think that that, that is a significant hack to yeah. helping people, you know. And I think that's one of the big advantages of Bitcoin relative to other things because nobody really thinks in Ethereum. Like they don't think they're like, oh, I got so much dollars of Ethereum. Nobody, nobody thinks of like, 
I got 20 ether, you know? Yeah. Or I got, I got, I get 10,000, you know, 4,000 Solana. This is like <laughs> got so much dollars worth of Solana, right? Yeah, but like exactly. Bitcoin yeah. is different because, um, you know, Bitcoin is, it really is the, it, this unit, <laughs> you know, the units of Bitcoin. And, and I, the other thing I would say is definitely, and I know people, some people may not agree with this, but I would definitely um, get get used to buy, send, not buying and selling, but get used to using Bitcoin wallets and transacting with Bitcoin. Even if mm -hmm. it's small amounts, I think that's another thing I, w I would recommend everybody do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, use Lightning, use Bitcoin wallets. Uh, just be, don't just put it in one thing and just forget about it. You know? Yeah. I think, you know, I think getting involved a little bit, and you don't have to go crazy. You know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to go, you know, looking for the rest of one restaurant in your town that accepts Bitcoin. But <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily a bad idea to do that a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's fun to see the technology in action. I well, try it's, to you, use it. Look, it's just yeah. sort of like you need to remember. It's, it's one of these things is if you don't exercise, you lose muscle, right? Mm. And I think it's useful, like, it's useful to actually do trades and send people Bitcoin and send a friend Bitcoin. I owe you some money. Here, I'll give you some Bitcoin. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I feel like... He, People should remember this is a peer-to-peer -peer transaction test. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, you know, I recommend people in the U.S., you know, we have this cash app thing here. And I say, everybody should use cash app and, you know, get get in the mode of stuff. And, you know, you want to buy an, like, I, I'm in favor of these ordinals and stuff. You know, you want to buy an ordinal or something, go do it, you know. And and you don't, don't spend a lot of money, but just, you know, get get a little bit used to things moving things in Bitcoin, you know, get yeah. familiarize yourself with block, you know, mempool, you know, understand how Bitcoin works. And I think that, I think that once you get in, I think you really, it's, it, you don't want to go any other place, you know, like you're, yeah. you're like, I like the Bitcoin world. I like blocks. I like having a block, you know what I mean? Yeah, I like, exactly. I like checking block times. I like, you know, I like uh, all these things and all these things are part of Bitcoin to me. And I think, you know, being part of that world and really being into that world and really understanding the difference between SegWit and Taproot and these type of addresses and, you know, all this stuff will help you become a better Bitcoin, you know? Yeah, I agree. So I think that that's, you know, like I would use every single lightning wallet that exists every i would test out 10 different wallets and you know i'd you know try, try moving some money between them you know yeah try different uh different custody solution don't just do one and then just leave it and let it sit for two years and then then realize you didn't actually store your words properly or something you know <laughs> so i think just usage is very important yeah. And, uh, you know, and join a Bitcoin meetup groups and, you know, yeah, that, that, those things I think are important, you know, and yeah. I actually got my hairdresser onto Bitcoin. So now every time go. I go, I pay him in Bitcoin. So that's, well, that's good. See, that's the thing. It's, it's, and it's not, e look, even paying somebody on chain Bitcoin is not terrible. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, the fees are actually kind of reasonable right now. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I agree. And so yeah. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I think that uh, the I, mean, I, I love the Bitcoin. Bitcoin. I actually, love the whole yeah. ecosystem of Bitcoin. So like, there's nothing mm. about any of a part of it that I don't like, you know. Yeah. And so, but I, I, I know there's a lot of people who, well, for example, we were doing this one space, and um, you know, this this guy. Uh, uh, Gary Cardone, he, we had this bet and he lost this bet and this Bitcoin Beagle guy won. And then Gary is like, okay, he goes, okay, you're paying a hundred thousand sats. And he was like, I don't know how to send a hundred thousand sats. I'm like, wait a second. Like you got, you have Bitcoin, right? And he goes, yeah, well, Coinbase, you know, I don't, 
like, okay, you got to learn how to send Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're like, like you know, you don't know how to send Bitcoin. You're not a Bitcoiner. I mean, you're. What are you doing on a Bitcoin space? Mm-hmm. You know, talking about Bitcoin for hours on the end when you actually can't. If you can't send somebody a hundred thousand sats like that, you you need to do, you need to do your homework a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Well, I think it's it's the summary is like study Bitcoin in breadth and and depth, right? And you you try everything out, and I think that's also well for me. It's what's fun. It's like I'm learning every day still. This is such a it's such a huge thing, and so every every day there's a new new topic to learn or or a thing to try out. So that's always just very rewarding. There's a lot I think. of cool tools out there, and there's a yeah, lot exactly. of you know there's a lot of there's a lot of good projects and cool tools and. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, too. And and I think that, you know, part of it is if you stay interested in these things, you become a better holder of this stuff because yeah. it's like, OK, this this is kind of what I'm this is all relates to my passion, which is this Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. So that's what I think. All right. All right, Fred, to wrap up the last okay. question. Yeah. And I ask everyone the same question. Oh, what is okay. a core belief you will never let go? A core belief that I will never let go. Um, a core belief about Bitcoin. Anything. Okay. Uh, I think my core belief is that you really need to do it yourself. You need to. You need to be hands on, and you have to make up your own mind and not accept other people's opinion but just make up your own mind about these things like you it's not good enough to to be like well sailor said it you know Mm. or so and so said it or fred said it or fred said power law like no you should you should a hundred percent convince yourself of whatever you're thinking but you have to go through all the work yourself and you have to convince yourself and you should make up your own mind because that's the only way you're going to have really strong convictions, I think. Um, Love that. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what Couldn't I Couldn't agree more, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this is also what Bitcoin invites you to do, right? I think that's the whole point. Like you don't have to believe what people like us say about Bitcoin. The entire idea is that we invite you so you can study it because it's so transparent that you don't have to believe us. That's the entire point, right? But you have to right. do that work, as you said. Well, like, that's, you have that's to why I love it so much because it's, yeah. it's, it's just, it. well, from my perspective, it's so mathematical. It's just so transparent. Yeah. And, and you know, I love that every little thing is like, like even, even in Ethereum, they're not even sure how many Ether there are. Nobody's even sure. Like, Something's wrong with that system, right? When they can't even tell you how many there is, you know. Yeah, and they're changing but, it again. Well, and they're changing it again. like I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like to me, there's something fundamentally wrong. But Bitcoin, it's just it's black and white, and uh, you know, there's there's no sort of real mysteries there. It's all you know. It's mm-hmm. it's it's you know, the, there's mysteries as to why it's working the way it is, and you know, like it is kind of. It's almost feels like it's an alien force, you know. It's like this thing was created and it's just working so well and it's taking yeah. over the world in such a way. Hmm. I don't know why that is exactly. Why why is it so, you know, it just seems like it was just it was created once, one code, changed a little bit but not much, you know. Yeah. Well, I think it's because it it just works. It sounds it so works. stupid, I agree but it that. works and everyone can check it out. And I think maybe to add to what you said, like if you're studying Bitcoin, like one of the things to keep an eye on is, you know, the halving that's coming up. That's not yeah, just definitely. like, oh, uh, the, you know, the block rewards are split in half, but this is actually like a celebration of the the fact that we can trust the rules that right. are set out for this monetary system, right? If the halving happens on the date that we predict, that actually right. shows you that the monetary um, policy of this system is true and enforced and adopted by everyone who uses it, right? That's the totally entire right. point. And um, yeah, I think that that's a nice illustration of, I think, what we 
studied and now believe in. So, uh, well, Bram, it's so uh, great talking to you. And, and, you know, if I'm ever in Netherlands, I'll uh, look you up. Hit me up. And, yeah. And uh, if and you're ever in LA, let's uh, come, come by. Let's do it. Well, thanks so much for your time thanks. and this conversation. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Bram. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.